The Holy Gospel for the day is taken from the fifth chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. I invite you to stand for the reading of the Gospel. Jesus said, You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You've heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your, heaven, your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on evil and on good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Let us pray for the blessing of the Spirit to anoint the word. Come, Holy Spirit, and settle over us that this would be your word to us today. Open our hearts that we might hear what you would have us know. Amen. Apparently, it's a proven fact that if someone annoys you, it takes 42 muscles in your face to make a frown. But it takes only four muscles in your arm to reach up and smack them upside the head. <laughs> now that's our world, isn't it? We smack first and frown later. And we have found numerous very creative ways to smack someone, everyone from lawsuits to shunning to violence. It's all present in our world, all ways of striking out at people who hurt us. One night a little boy was aggravated as his, at his father because his dad had gotten after him for something. Pretty soon it was time to go to bed, so he was getting ready for bed, and he knelt down beside his bed to say his evening prayers, and he said the same kind of prayers that he says every evening, ending with a request for blessing for everyone in the family, except one, his father. And when he was done with the prayer, he looked up at his father, and he said, I suppose you noticed you weren't in it. That's another common response, isn't it? If we can't smack, then we'll just ask God to get revenge for us. But Jesus invites us into something entirely different, a whole new way, not the smacking, God will get even with you way in a troubled and tumultuous world, a worrisome world, but something entirely different. And when we live as Jesus calls us to live, the world may change around. In order to fully understand this, we actually have to look at the text that came before this one, the one that we actually looked at last week. So I would remind you that that text began with Jesus saying, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribe and Pharisees, you cannot go into the kingdom of heaven. And then he went on to sharpen the law and make it even more difficult to keep, revealing to everyone that it's not just a matter of your behavior, but it's also a matter of what's in your heart. And anyone hearing him that day would have known absolutely without question that if the scribes and Pharisees were not good enough to earn salvation for themselves, then no one else would have been able to either. And in the end, Jesus' words drive us to grace so that we begin to recognize that our salvation hinges only on one thing, God's grace, mercy, and love. And when we live in that, things may very well change. Then today's text is Jesus talking about what it looks like when we get that. When we actually get and embrace that our salvation and our human dignity comes from God's love, mercy, and grace for us. When we understand that, then how do we live? And it's something very different than what you might have thought. Now I want to say up front that what Jesus is doing here is not 
asking us to just sit back and take everything. He is, this is not a call to be passive. In fact, I would say to you that anyone who thinks Jesus was passive has never met the Jesus of the Gospels. They've only met the Jesus that some people think is in the Gospels. Jesus' words about turn the other cheek, give up your shirt, and walk the second mile are far from passive, as we will see. So keep that in your mind. In order to understand that, however, you have to transport yourself back to first century and think the way that first century people thought and understand their customs and most especially their taboos. So Jesus begins with a word about a very commonly understood Old Testament idea, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Generation upon generation has misunderstood that thinking that it means that you have a right to revenge. But what that actually means is that the punishment cannot be greater or worse than the crime. That is to say, if someone steals your ox, you cannot take their life. Or if someone fails to repay your loan, you cannot break their knees. Do you see that? It's an issue of justice. But then Jesus calls us to take the next step and not only make a measured response to the people who have hurt us, but also to let go of the need for revenge entirely. Here's where first century thought is crucial. Jesus uses the first example. He says, when someone strikes you on the right cheek, now that's really crucial. I'm going to stop and explain that. If I want to hit Jim's right, we hold your right hand up so I know which is your right cheek. Okay, okay. If I want to hit Jim on the right cheek, I can use my left hand to hit him, or I can hit him with the back of my right hand. The problem was that in first century, the left hand was the hand you used for unclean acts, and it was considered un unwise and taboo to do anything with that hand. Sometimes even just doing a gesture would cause a penalty. So the person striking you, if they're going to hit your right cheek, cannot use their left hand. But to backhand somebody, to use the back of the hand, was understood as an insult. That's what a master did to a slave. That's what an authority did to someone who had no recourse, no way to stand up against that. So when Jesus says, if someone strikes your right cheek, he is speaking about an unequal relationship where the person being struck has really no recourse. Of course, there are two things that person can do. One, a person can strike the master back, but in that day, that probably would mean that you would be executed. The other is he can just fall into submission, cower before the master. But Jesus suggests another option. Jesus says if they do that, present them the left cheek. Turn your face and present your left cheek. Now the striker has a dilemma because if he wants to hit him with a fist, it'll have to be his left hand. He's going to have to use his left hand if he's, if he's going to backhand, I mean. So that if he wants to continue to humiliate, he has to use his backhand of his left, but he can't use his left hand. So now he's presented with the left, and the only way he can strike the left is either with a fist or an open hand, which is the way you hit an equal. You see, backhanding was a way of humiliating someone. It wasn't to hurt somebody. It was to humiliate them into being under control. And when he turns the other cheek, it says, your blow didn't have the desired effect. It didn't make me cower. It didn't make me controlled. It didn't dehumanize me. It's in effect saying, I'm a human being. You cannot dehumanize me. I may not be able to strike you back, but if you're going to hit me, you've got to hit me as an equal. The second one is very similar. The second one is in a court of law, and Jesus says, give also your shirt. Well, it turns out that in order for this to happen, the person who's going to court had to have used his outer cloak as collateral for a loan. Now, who would do that? Only the poorest of the poor would give literally the shirt off their back as collateral for a loan. That means they've borrowed from someone unscrupulous. And now this person wants the very shirt off their back. So Jesus suggests, give them not only that, but give them also your undershirt, which is like underwear. To do that, the person would have to stand in the court stark naked. 
Now, being naked was a taboo in that culture, but the one who is shamed is not the one who's naked, but rather the one who views the naked person or who has caused the person to be naked. You might remember in the story of Noah, one of his children sees him naked, and that child is struck dead. It's the person who sees the nakedness who is shamed. So that put yourself in the position of this poor debtor. He's about to lose the last possession he has. It's going to reveal to the world that he has a wretched life. There is nothing worth living in his life. And so Jesus says, give him not only that, but give him your undershirt. And in that way, you are standing up against a corrupt system that would require that of anyone. And besides that, you shame the man who's got the credit on you. The third one also is similar, only this time it stands up against the all-powerful Roman government. Because the Romans had a law that said a soldier or certain other people could make any occupied person carry their pack for one mile, but they couldn't go more than one mile. And if they tried to go more than one mile, they could be punished, sometimes very severely, even and including up to death. So just imagine you're this soldier and you see this sort of unimportant looking Jewish guy and you hand him your pack and you make him walk with you one mile. And you get to the end of the mile and the guy says, okay, now I'm going with you a second mile. Now who's in control? Now who has power in the situation? And not only that, this probably would prevent soldiers from asking anyone because the truth is, you look at all these Jewish people, you can't tell which ones of them follow that rabbi Jesus and therefore will walk a second mile and get you into trouble, maybe even cost your life. Do you see there is no better way to pull the teeth of unholy power than to fail to be awed by it? And I would remind you that we began this conversation by saying, this is how you live when you are undergirded by the knowledge of God's grace, mercy, and love for you. When you know that your very life and salvation depends on God and God's grace, mercy, and love, then you can respond in a wholly different way. Every one of these three are forms of nonviolent resistance. They resist evil, but they refuse to use the tactics of evil to resist evil. And if you think about it, every part of Jesus' life is that to a T. This is descriptive, ultimately, of everything Jesus does. Jesus forgives, because what recourse does the enemy have if you forgive them? What can they now do to you? And Jesus goes to the cross. The cross is the divine turning of the cheek in which evil is once and for all overcome without using the tiniest shred of evil to do it. Powerful gifts for the living of life. So how might this turning of the other cheek walking the second mile, how might that look in today's world? How might we resist evil without becoming evil? Well, maybe for some of us it might be turning in an abusive spouse. For some it might be standing up to racism or sexism or classism or any kind of ism, even when it's not popular to do that. For some it might be standing for justice and mercy in the courts. For some, it might be refusing to laugh at a joke that demeans a particular ethnic group or that demeans um, a gender, one particular gender. For some, it might be refusing to engage in gossip, just walking away from gossip. For some, it might be refusing to engage in hurtful behavior. For some of us, it might be doing the hard work that it takes in order that we don't have our past standing on us, but we stand on our past. For some, it might be facing the things that shame and demean us in such a way that we are armed with God's love for us. In short, these teachings of Jesus remind us that the powerless are given the return of their human dignity simply by God's love for them. And that is very likely to change the world. In 2003, a survey was done in the country of Indonesia. You may know that Indonesia is the most Muslim country in the world. This survey was testing attitudes towards Americans, and at that time, only 15% 
of the people of Indonesia had a favorable view of Americans. Then in December of 2004, the tsunami hit. And you might remember all the terrible devastation that just wiped over the whole nation of Indonesia. As a result, many Westerners, Americans included, just threw themselves into relief, helping not only with dollars, but with people. And by the way, the ELCA, the World Lutheran World Federation, and other Lutheran bodies around the world were big participants in that relief effort. After that, the very prestigious Indonesian Survey Institute did another survey, and they discovered that the favorability of Americans had jumped astronomically after the efforts of the tsunami, from um, only 15% thinking that a favorable thought about Americans to now 44%. And not only that, but the study revealed that the lowest support for bin Laden and terrorism of all time, especially since September 11, was happening right at that time. And the highly unfavorable view of Americans went from 48% of the people of Indonesia to only 13%. Make no mistake, nonviolent resistance and living in the light of God's grace, mercy, and love for you changes not only you, but it will, in fact, change the world. If you want to be a part of what God is doing to transform the world, that's exactly where you go with it. That's exactly price, precisely what you do with it. You participate in, in ways that are pleasing to God, standing up to the evil in the world around you. When you do that, everything changes. <laughs>